Welcome to Dare to Dream. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do brilliant energy work around the world. You can attend their workshops, get their online programs, or become a facilitator. Dr. Dane, D-A-I-N, here, H-E-E-R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. Visit them today. The Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. Dare to Dream is ranked in the top 100 best podcasts in USA in self-improvement on all of Apple Podcasts and ranks in the top 50 podcasts in many other countries as well, thanks to you. Debbie Dashinger is a certified coach whose expertise is visibility in media. She coaches people to write a page-turner book takes their book to a guaranteed international bestseller status, and she pulls back the curtain so clients have the system to be interviewed on media and podcasts to get massive results. Debbie shows people how to find and use media exposure to locate their tribe, fill workshops, sell books, and gain exposure. You can connect with Debbie at debbie-singer.com. Also, get your free tools and templates. She's giving away a free complimentary guide for you about how you can get booked and how you can find out what your message is. Go to debbie-singer.com slash message. My guest a little bit later on is Ruben Langdon, a little bit about him. Question is, if you want to explore science, spirituality, and virtual reality, Ruben, Ruben Langdon is your guy. He's a voice actor documentarian, actor, filmmaker, stuntman, video game star, and a fight and stunt coordinator. You have seen Ruben in Pirates of the Caribbean, the Power Rangers series, and Avatar, where he was the stunt double for Jake Sully's alien Avatar. Ruben shot to stardom in video games with leading roles as Ken Masters in Street Fighter and Dante in the Devil May Cry franchise. He's worked with actors Jackie Chan and Andy Serkis, as well as directors James Cameron, Peter Jackson, and Steven Spielberg. It was while working on James Cameron's Avatar that Ruben had his first UFO sighting which sent him in the direction of ufology and the paranormal. So for over a decade, Ruben has been researching the extraterrestrial phenomenon. He's the host of the popular TV show, Interview with Extra Dimensionals on the Gaia Network. And in 2013, he co-produced the five-day event at the National Press Club in Washington, DC called the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure, which to date, is the most comprehensive body of evidence and testimony delivered to the public on the ET subject matter. To find out more about him, go to rubenlangdon.com. This is Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream podcast and radio, and Ruben Langdon, welcome to Dare to Dream. Hi, Debbie. It's great Thanks to for have having you. Me. Excellent, excellent. So, you know, I've done a lot of research on you and I want to start out. It looks like you were born in Alaska, true or yeah. false? Wow, true. Yes, you did do some research. <laughs> what was that like? I don't remember. I, uh, at the young age of, I think, like four, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. So I, I only have memories of snow being above my head, um, just glimpses of the cats my mom used to have, um, you know, I think being held by uh, my dad and, and mom, and that's about it. I mean, there's just, there's not a whole lot of memory there. Mm. And I heard something, you were being interviewed somewhere, you were sharing something about a cult, that mm. there was a brief period in your childhood where your parents were involved in a cult, and that a spiritual cult, yeah, my mom, my mom was involved with, um, I don't really want to name names because there's different ideas, but my idea of what a cult is, it, it was nothing heavy like, you know, sacrificing or anything like that. It was just like, a, uh, just a mind manipulation, um, buying into certain ideas and beliefs to go into fear, which we could say any, you know, mainstream religion is kind of a cult in a way. 
but uh, in this sense, it was a sort of a new agey type teachings. And that was where I got a lot of the exposure to a lot of stuff I'm, I'm, I'm into now. Um, at a young age, I was exposed to it. I didn't buy into it because I could see 10 steps ahead to where it had become sort of a cult type idea. And my mom was into that uh, during my junior high and high school years. Fortunately, uh, she met someone to help her kind of break free from that reality. And uh, for the past 20 plus years, she's been living with uh, her new partner in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, cold free. So it was just a short blip on the radar in my life um, where I was experiencing that. And it wasn't anything malicious or malicious in the sense of just your typical manipulation and money power grabs. That's it. You know, again, we have that in religion. Now we have that in politics. We have that everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, so it's, it's nothing to get to uh, like, Oh, cult. Oh my God. Like, you know, like right now we have the Nexium scandal and all of these other like major cults that are like just bad stuff. So it's, it, it's nothing like that. Cult ish. Okay. Yeah, ish, ish is my favorite word on the planet. Yeah. It's it's really not a commitment word. I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's so cool that I got to meet you and spend time with you before mm -hmm. I got to really plow into your work. I actually prefer that. I love mm -hmm. to get a vibe for somebody first and feel that connection. Sure. And then you then I can go out and research you and you can blow my mind. So your stunt reels, I mean, mm -hmm. you're a beast. I do not even <laughs> understand that. It's so impressive, really so impressive. Did you play sports as a kid? Where does all of that come from, that ability? Uh, focus. Um, no, I, I was actually the biggest nerd growing up in uh, school. I hated sports. That was actually, PE was the subject I hated the most. Huh. Um, I was not very good at like team sports, but I did enjoy the outdoors. Uh, I, I got into rock climbing at a, at a young age and I liked sort of adrenaline type stuff. So rock climbing, um, I used to go um, climb up water towers in, in the middle of the night in Atlanta, Georgia and the rural areas and set up ropes and repel off of them oh God. Uh, for thrills. Your mother. Um, and I would do it like Australian style. So you kind of just jump off the building and you're, you're in a sense a controlled free fall. And um, I did all kinds of crazy stuff like that as a kid. So I had this adrenaline. I had enough of a physical ability to not kill myself during those, <laughs> those operations. But when it came to sports, I was not the sports guy. I had an interest in martial arts, but never thought I could do it myself mm. until I moved to Japan at the young age of 19. And, uh, and martial arts was everywhere uh, being in that culture. So I signed up for some classes and I started taking uh, Aikido and uh, that was my first martial arts. So um, I, I, I picked it up really fast. Uh, again, I, I think really... you picked it up really fast <laughs> at 19. That's at amazing. 19. So I didn't start my real journey into st stunts and sort of physical uh, abilities of focal focused anything uh, until really it was the age of 19 20 ish and, and uh, I was behind the curve on the martial arts side because most kids and stunt people who had been had a career and it had started at a very young age either in gymnastics or martial arts or something like that so I had to I had a lot to catch up on but I luckily for me when I just put my mind to something I I, I go all in and um I didn't let it hold me back and studied in Japan while I was living there uh, daily. That was, uh, uh, I had daily classes in um, acting, martial arts, uh, stunt acting, gymnastics, sword play, uh, anything I could get my hands on uh, to get to that place of being like this action guy. That was my, my focus. And in your reel, it shows these incredible feats, you know, you're being thrown from something onto something that appears to be very hard. It shows you being literally your whole body being thrown into trees and kicking people in a 360. Yeah. So 
have you ever had an injury? Have oh, you ever, tons. Yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's. Are uh, you gonna like point out broken yeah, arm? Yeah, I got a broken collarbone here. You know, it's uh, and I've got a broken ankle and or had a bro. You know, they're they're mended now, but they're still out of proportion from what they used to be. Uh, so and you know, broken tailbone, mm. broken fingers. Um, so it's it comes part of the territory. Is you break things. Uh, you get bruised up, you get beat up. It's, it's when you're, it, things happen, you know, when you're, be, when you're doing it, you, the idea is to do it without getting hurt. And most of the ones in my reel, actually, I, had, I didn't, I, those are all ones I got walked away from and did many takes, never had any serious injuries there. It's the, it's the little stuff when you're not paying attention that you get injured in. You're a member of a group, a California martial arts stunt group called Zero Gravity. What is that like when you get together? Do you punch each other or? Yeah, that, that group's no longer together. It was um, it was a group from a group of guys from Northern California who were moving down to Southern California. And at the time, my style of martial arts, which came from living and working in Japan and Hong Kong and sort of the Jackie Chan style of things, that wasn't really a, uh, it was just starting to make its way into Hollywood with you know advent of the Matrix and Charlie's Angels and other films. Yeah that uh, uh, took on that type of style of action cinema. Uh, Power Rangers was one. And these guys kind of had that flavor and flair and I invited them to come and train with uh, my buddy and I were running classes, uh, my, my buddy from Korea, uh, uh, Hapkido champion. And uh, we invited them to come and train with us and work with us. And then we just decided to merge our our groups. We had a small group already, and we we were sort of going under the zero gravity team name for a little bit, and then and then everybody just kind of got busy and doing their own thing. And and now most of the uh, zero gravity members are can be seen in all the major Hollywood films: mm -hmm. Avengers, Black Panther. Um, you know, any any big Hollywood film uh, that you see out there, uh, including the the new Mandalorian project. Um, oh. All of these guys are in, all stunt performers and choreographers and, and sort of have made a name for themselves in the Hollywood industry. So cool. And, and it's amazing how dispersed your interests are. It's great you follow them all. Mm -hmm. They're not just hobbies. So <laughs> you've been passionate about this film and you, we just shared before we started filming here that um, you just put in a lot more work on this. It's called Citizen Hearing on Disclosure. Very, very interesting. The mm -hmm. film that you worked on documents 40 researchers along with military and agency and right. political people of really high rank and they all testify to the United States Congress. So what does the citizen hearing on disclosure set out to accomplish? Why that film? Well, it's, it's actually, it's it's not a film. It's actually, well, it was, it was two things. In its initial in inception, it was uh, going to be an event, which it was, that part we got through. Uh, that happened in 2013 at the National Press Club in Washington, DC, uh, a couple blocks from the White House. And the event, was uh, filmed and it was a mock congressional hearing uh, with six former members of Congress because in the sort of the motto was if Congress won't do their job, then the people will. Mm -hmm. So we initiated the citizen hearing on disclosure, um, a mock congressional hearings to hold hearings on the subject matter that the human race is being engaged by extraterrestrials. The evidence is there, the witnesses are there um, and from and that these event, are real witnesses. These are people who really have real, their hand on yeah. proof, scientific proof, personal experience. Exactly. And most, mostly they're ex-government and military officials. Mm -hmm. uh, and we tend in our society to take those people more credible because if they've held some sort of security position, uh, like we have head of SACNIC bases, um, we have you know the former head of investigations of the FAA, we had other pilots uh, airline pilots, as well as uh, military pilots from uh, South America and from uh, Europe as well. We had many airmen. So a lot of military officials, it just for more for the gravitas of, of it. We had six former members of Congress, three uh, who had just retired just a couple months prior, and the others were one senator, 
a senator from Alaska, Senator Gravel, who actually was in charge for releasing the Pentagon Papers back during the Nixon era. So we had some heavy hitters, people who we, well, the, the goal was for the media to catch on and to then report on this because the, it's, it's a serious issue that's been laughed at for a long time. And we thought, well, what better way to uh, convince the media, which then could report on this, if we just get all the heavy hitters together in one room. So it happened, five days, over 40 uh, hours of testimony. So it's, it's uh, I'm sorry, over 30 hours of testimony um, and over 40 witnesses. Now, what that proved to me at the, after doing that, I thought this is it, we're gonna have disclosure. No, you cannot, you cannot put a cap on this event. Like it's too big. It is a multi-million dollar budget. Um, and we were filming a movie around it too, simultaneously. The movie, unfortunately, uh, due to some issues with funding, we had to can it. Um, so we're, we did the event, we live streamed it, uh, invited all the press to come down and listen to the testimony and talk to the witnesses and interact with the Congress members. And uh, what I realized is there truly is a truth embargo on the media and that the media in a whole is uh, for the most part um, being controlled by some special interest groups. Uh, at the time, I, I, I heard that from other people. I'm like, no, this will this will do it. This will this will blow the whistle. We've got this. We're going to get it out there. And during the event, seeing how the news handled it and seeing the ridicule and seeing the uh, the the way that um, it was stifled and not uh, investigated uh, like a proper journalist should do proper uh, research and talk to these people and look at the evidence and actually do their job if they were a real journalist and that did not happen so I got very discouraged after this event and realized that the problem is much bigger than what we could even imagine. And we're starting to understand this and see this now mm -hmm. um, it, with it, with all the political games that are going, going on. Um, but it's not until now. And if I tried to talk to people at that time in 2013 about the citizen hearing, what's happening, the government and the politics and the international baking cartels and what we know now is the cabal and all of this stuff, uh, people were just laughing at me and just like, what are you talking about, Ruin? You're nuts. Uh, now I could have that conversation with more and more people and I'm not so nutso. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's interesting. But uh, that series, that, um, that event was recorded and it's, uh, we're getting ready to have a, a major re-release -re of that, uh, of that uh, documentation. So I'm excited to be bringing, to help bring that to the world, to see, to try to see for a second time. And I think now people are going to be more open to it than ever before. Did you consider this a historic event? Absolutely. Yeah. How so? Well, I think we're about to find out. Once it gets re-released, I think people will, uh, if given the chance to listen to it, to, to pay attention to it, then then it paints a clear picture why the UFO subject has been covered up, why it continues to be covered up, and the different agendas behind the cover up and, and, uh, and the players involved. Okay, so people who are interested who would like to see this because it is available can go to it's citizen, available now. Yes. citizenhearing.org. Correct. Okay, fantastic. So you can watch the footage of these really brave people giving testimonies. I think you'll be very impressed by who steps up and a lot of what they have to say and share. And I, so I want to bounce around a little bit because sure. it yeah. has me curious when when you say that and you talk about the cover up. So then it makes me wonder. So you're doing the show, season mm -hmm. two. We're all out here waiting for season three, and this is interview with Ed which is a mm -hmm. hilarious name, by the way, when you think about it. 
<laughs> just saying. Yeah, but what right. he means is extra dimensional. So right. in an interview with extra dimensional. So, you know, this is a great show because I, you know, I'm here with you because it changed my life, right? It oh, opened great. me up in a huge way. And we can share more about that later, but this is about you. And I really want to focus on this. How has the media treated you? How has your show been received out in the world? Well, it's, it's been well received throughout the world uh, as well as the citizen hearing was as well when it was uh, initially launched. Um, it's not the world that has a problem with these types of shows. It's the, it's the uh, control power, power, control and power structures of the planet. Now with my show, Ed, the reason I took that angle and the reason I went down that path of interviewing channelers who have, uh, who channel beings from other dimensional realities is one I saw in the, uh, being in the evidence-based ufology uh, community that the citizen hearing sort of revolves more around that world and those people. And being in that reality, I saw a lot of evidence that the, to prove the phenomenon is real. I saw and talked to a lot of contactees, abductees, researchers, experiencers, um, military people. I talked to all these people and beyond a doubt, shadow, there's no shadow of a doubt that this is a real phenomenon and that we are being engaged by extraterrestrials. What bothered me was most of these people knew from their experiences that the phenomenon was, for the most part, a benevolent phenomenon. However, knowing that, they still perpetuated a story of fear. They still perpetuated an idea that there still might be a boogeyman behind the curtain that's going to get you, even though they've been behind the curtain and they've experienced it themselves. Mm reason why is because they themselves have been uh have bought into the idea that the only way to get this information out is to perpetuate a story of fear and that's essentially how major mainstream media operates is uh, for example ancient aliens which has done a huge um uh, service to humanity to bringing this message out, uh, they still always end with maybe it could be mean or it could be evil or it could be good or bad. We really don't know, but evidence seems to say that it's positive, but I still think it might be bad. You know, that's how they always kind of end that stuff. And, and in a sense, the mainstream media, in order for you to put out a message, if it doesn't have that spin, it won't go out there. Uh, it, or it hasn't up until the truth embargo, I think, ended in 2017. Hmm. Uh, or I should say it became it's starting to break up where there's still a truth embargo, but it's being the, the, the waters are very muddy. So um, even so even I had all of that experience and then I started interviewing the channelers and they started fitting all the pieces of the puzzle and just confirming stuff I already knew and my research had brought me to these things. And then I started to get a bigger worldview picture of, oh, okay, the, there's no way we're going to break those power structures from the outside being in, or from even participating in that game. In a sense, we're get, it's like a slow drip type of, of, of disclosure. Yes, there's aliens. Could they be evil? Could they? Like, I already know. Why do we have to go through that stage? I already know they're benevolent. I already know. Uh, we can communicate with them. I already know we can uh, uh, get energy exchange and get some information and free energy and all this stuff. Like these are already things I've already researched and know, but why do we have to beat around the bush in this media structure? Uh, because, well, people may not want it and they do this and there's all this thing. No, that's an excuse. The people want this information. You don't want it being the filter or the, uh, the, the guy, and I say you meaning the, the, the media structure that's releasing this is the one that's the, the gatekeepers of the information that are funneling all information and disseminating it to their own uh, means to the people. And that's, therein lies the problem. Mm -hmm. So I had to go outside of that structure 
because I, I had a production company in the Marina. Uh, I was doing visual effects, working on major, you know, triple A video games, uh, working on the film avatar. I was, I was already at the top of the top of where you could be. And yet I couldn't get this information out there, even though people wanted it, the producers from the networks wanted it, it would get shut down from the top. And, and then going through the citizen hearing, I was realizing, okay, there's something, this is, there is a truth embargo. There's something about this. So I thought, okay, I need to self, I need to create my own show, self-distribute on Vimeo and talk in a, almost a secret code where people uh, who resonated with the information to just get it and then digest it that way. And then I did that for a couple of years and then Gaia being, being open to all kinds of stuff uh, said, Hey, we really like your show. A lot of people on our uh, team want us to have the show. And I'm like, I'd love for you guys to have the show. So you get it out there to a bigger audience. That would be great. So then that's when they picked it up. Uh, and then they, they put it out there. And it's, again, it seems to be really resonating with a lot of people. Um, this idea that we're not, that the evil uh, reptilians aren't here to drink our blood and, 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 and dissect us and um, turn us into slaves, that there's an actual positive message be behind all this, you know. And by default, by program, a lot of us still subscribe to these fear-based uh, stories because that's what we've grown up and that's what we've known and that's, that's what's comfortable. So for a lot of us, it's just a, a, a matter of comfort that we subscribe to these old stories but I, for me, is I know there's a new story. I know there's a positive story here. And enough people are telling the old story. I need to focus on, on the new one. On the, oh, on the I love that. It's, it's so perfect for right now anyway. We're in the precipice of so much change and shifting going on that that makes complete sense that that would also be the same energy out into the universe and the universe back to us. And it's clear from your bio that you yourself, while you're working on Avatar, Ruben, you have mm -hmm. experience. What was your mm -hmm. UFO experience? Was it only one? Was it several? And how did that all start? It, it was pretty basic. Um, if you, you know, you go as you, you being, you being in this world as well as me now, you, we, we've had some pretty uh, intense experiences, but the first one for me, um, it was just some white specks in the sky, uh, you know, and I say that nonchalantly at the time my mind was blown and I couldn't, I was like, what the hell's going on? Um, but, you know, it, looking back on it, it could have just been satellites or something, you know, some other kind of aerial phenomenon, but it was all I needed to uh, unplug me from the matrix in a sense to uh, my good friend, Jeremy Corbell, what he says is weaponize my curiosity uh, was weaponized from that event. And that's all I needed was a, a small event like that to happen. So I could start following the breadcrumbs to lead, lead uh, me to where we are today. Mm. And so, yeah, I mean, I mentioned, I blame you for, <laughs> you blame me. <laughs> I blame you fully for all the weird looks um, that anybody who's known me for a really long time in my life, if I start to share currently, I can't say what I'm into. That is so wrong. That's like saying I'm suddenly into watching soccer games. It actually feels like this huge space in my life has been opened in the best possible way. But it is because my partner, Rob, was watching your show, was crazy about it. and was like, no, you got to see this. You got to see this. I'm like, I'm sitting down, I'll watch one. You know, and then I, we would find something compelling and I'm like, okay, I know truth. I feel energy. So yes. I know when I'm hearing something and it's resonating and I'm one of those people who was a, a bit of an eye roller, like, that's cool. I, I mean, it makes sense that we're not the only ones, but at the same time, like kind of, hmm. Anyway, I, I just kept watching because the truth kept emanating and I was loving what I was hearing and seeing. And I really liked the way you did it. I thought the the take you have, you, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could have done the show, but the way you did the show just felt so good and right and made me want to watch more. And then pff, I've had many people on my show now that you've had and, you know, met you at one of these contact workshops. And it's just, um, it's so 
it's wonderful, frankly. And I agree with you shifting from the, what we've been fed even by movies that we've watched over time and sci-fi books, this yep. terror of what could happen and the control they could have to yep. suddenly saying, no, this is a beautiful opening to a much deeper reciprocal relationship that's actually been going on for a really long time. Yep. So I want to know, so for the series, so mm -hmm. whatever, here's somebody saying, you've impacted me. You've mm -hmm. opened me up to a whole world I feel like I probably in some level have always been open to, but mm -hmm. now so consciously and awarely. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, for that service. What was your goal? What was your reason? Besides what you shared already, but like, yeah. did you want to get something out of it? Was, was Is there something you're hungry for that you're seeking with these people that that you hope or have already received? Yeah, I mean, the idea of, of contact, of interacting with a being from another civilization, to me, that is some of the most exciting idea, news, possibility thing that I could possibly ever think of uh, in, or imagine. Now, we, we watch movies and we say it's science fiction, but yet we have evidence, and I know this from doing the hearings and doing, and doing my other research, we have physical and eyewitness testimony that dates back literally thousands of years of people communicating with beings from other dimensional realities, both physically and mentally. Now, the evidence supports that that reality exists. So it's not necessarily science fiction. So if it's not science fiction and these people are having these experiences, why can't I have these experiences? If that's exciting to me, what, well, what's holding that back? What's holding me back from having these experiences? and what's holding society back from having these experiences. And that's what I chose to focus and investigate and put a lot of attention into. And I found through the technology, I call it technology of channeling, that we can have access to these beings um, through this unique technology, which a lot of people will, you know, uh, call woo woo and crazy or whatever, but, I've had enough experiences obviously through my show to prove that that is a valid technology to access uh, a dialogue and communication with these beings. In addition to that, we have other technologies with plant medicines, we have meditation, we have uh, breath work, we have, there's a lot of different modalities that we can do to get us closer to bridging the, the, uh, these different worlds and, and that, in my opinion, it, when I think about all the different stories, science fiction stories I could write or I could try to imagine or develop as a filmmaker, that's where I kind of started as an actor and then became a filmmaker. To me, that is the most exciting story, the greatest story that we could possibly imagine in, of all of our storytelling. It's actually happening right now. And my goal with all of this is to simply ref take, take what's happening out there, put a magnifying glass or a lens on that and say, look world, this is us, this is humans. We, we are far greater than any of our science fiction or any of the stories that are being told to us in society right now. All we gotta do is just choose where to put that lens. And how, much, me, how much do you have, how much team do you have working with you? Are you like, a guerrilla production company, like you're doing the interview, you're getting all the, all the um, cameras set up and, you know, making sure the audio is okay. Are you doing the editing or do you actually have a production team working for and with you? Uh, well, most of it's me. Season one was all me. Season two. Um, so being up here, I live in Big Bear, California, which is uh, about two and a half hours outside of LA. And uh, sort of all, I've been a one man band for, for uh, a few years, but I met uh, a good fellow brother named uh, Steve Copeland, who's uh, helping me. He came on board and started helping me with season uh, two. 
and uh, about halfway through season two, helped with the shoots and then definitely helping with the editing. And so now uh, it's just me and him, you know, mostly me with the show. And we've got some other projects we're working on together that uh, he's putting a little more attention into those while I try to get season three um, up and, and released and he'll jump in and help me out. But yeah, essentially it's me and him and that's it. <laughs> I know you've done, look, you've done some like a lot of amazing shows, a lot of amazing interviews, very riveting. So I don't want to play favorites, but I would really love to know on a personal level, Ruben, was there somebody that you brought on the show who literally changed the trajectory for you? Something opened up or really surprised you, you got something or learned something that really made a significant difference? Well, I have to say, the, the, the idea of the show came from Wendy Kennedy and, and Nora, Nora Harold, Wendy Kennedy and Daryl Anka. They were all coming to my, uh, I used to hold ET media meetup groups on Tuesday nights at my studio in the Marina back in 2010 to 2014. Um, and they grew from being just a small handful of people to being, you know, almost a uh, hundred people. Uh, at a night, um, we had the space to house it. So it, it was the first Tuesday of every month and they just kept growing and growing. And then Wendy and Nora and Daryl used to come to these events. I didn't know they were channelers. I didn't even, I knew what the channeling phenomenon was. I didn't really pay much attention to it. I was just all about the, the, the evidence stuff. Give me the, give me the real, the real goods. You know, that was how I, I looked at it. <laughs> And uh, after one night of, um, uh, of the meetings, I was just chatting with Wendy because she had mentioned in her introduction that she, had, she was a contactee and she had been brought in on the ships. And I had discussed with a lot of people at that time, I was fascinated with the, that experience and that phenomenon. And I started interviewing, I probably, um, you know, I don't have record of these, but I probably interviewed Oh, well over a hundred contactees uh, around that time, uh, trying to compare their experiences and understand the phenomenon even more. And uh, so I was kind of interviewing her, asked, you know, picking her brain. So what's going on? And she said, uh, well, you know, I was brought on the ship, the Zetas, they were taking my, uh, my uh, eggs and DNA and the, sort of the usual story. And then she said, she, but I, it was okay. I wasn't afraid because I knew it was a soul contract. And then it was like a light bulb went off in my head, a soul contract. What? Wait, wait, wait. That's for some reason that, that really resonated. I don't quite understand it, but I, it really resonated. Tell me more. And then she started getting into it and she says, yeah, the Palladians, the peas, they, you know, that's how they explained it to me. And I'm like, well, you're, you're talking to them now. What is this? Yeah. I do this thing called channeling. I'm like, what? Oh my God, no. And then I, so then I started listening to her, started listening to Nora and I started listening to Daryl Anka and Bashar. And then I started, it started really making a lot of sense. Like all of the, 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 the research I had been doing up until that point, and all the question marks were getting filled in uh, with, with the information. And I was like, but some of these people, some of these channelers don't have access to the information that I've had talking to these individual uh, whistleblowers and behind the scenes people and the hundreds of contactees that, that I had um, interacted with. These people aren't there with their research, how do they know this stuff? That's what was blowing my mind. So all of the uh, missing puzzle pieces were getting filled in. And that's when I knew, okay, this is the direction I need to go with my show is to fill in the, the puzzle pieces and to, to what I noticed that I really resonated with uh, the messages were they were all self-empowering as opposed to uh, victimization stories that the, um, a lot of the abductees would subscribe to. They would, uh, you could see the fear and you could see how disempowered they were by believing and buying into the fear where I could look at somebody like Wendy who said, it's a soul contract that I signed up for this. I agreed prior to this incarnation to, uh, to donate my genetic material for these experiments. I saw how she carried that, whether it's true or not, it didn't matter 
because she was a more empowered being and how she carried her life in her day to day um, just how she carried herself compared to someone who was, I was brought on the ships and they took me and I, I don't want it again, you know, and then you could see how it just trickled into their life, how that person was unstable and not trustworthy and the fear and there's all this other stuff. So I was like, okay, here's where I need to put my focus, whether it's true or not, I will figure that out on the, on my direction. But what I want, the, what I want is self-empowerment. I want people who may be having these experiences, but are able to use it in a positive light and not a negative one. Yeah, beautiful. I noticed uh, one of your episodes was with Lee McCloskey. Mm -hmm. I was invited to his home to do a sound bath. So it was interesting to see that you went in and filmed there. For people who don't know him or his house or this man, oh my God, will you describe what it's like inside his home and what he's done? Well, Lee's a modern day wizard. Yes. Um, and it's funny because a lot of people watch that episode and they, they say it just went over their head. And I, I think it's one of the most advanced episodes there is um, because of Lee's deep knowledge into the esoteric and into uh, the tarot and into all of these different ideas and subjects and, the, and what he channels through his art is phenomenal and all of the pieces though he used a different vernacular and he has a little bit different background i actually used lisa royale's um you know chart for the different civilizations and we overlap that in in, in with his um ideas and uh archetypes and explanations and everything fit like a perfect glove how you, it's just different language but these archetypes in these uh, ET races or, you know, esoteric, esoteric archetypes like the tarot, they're one and the same. And I, that's what I wanted to sort of prove was this idea of ETs. It's just the language. It's a, it's a concept that some of us gravitate towards this way, or we can gravitate to this way. And I'm a big fan of ETs. I want to go ride in spaceships. That's my other selfish reason why I'm doing all of this. <laughs> it's uh, probably the main reason actually is I just one day when I go for a ride with spaceship that's it um, and uh, even though I probably go up there every night but I want to remember it and I want to be able to, <laughs> even want to be able to like you know physically go in there and then like come out and say that was cool all right let's go and do another ride or whatever but Lee is a yeah he's an amazing being and uh, I was super excited I had done uh an interview with in season one on Ayana. I did it in his backyard there. Mm-hmm. And then I was thinking, man, I got to get Lee himself on the show. So season two, we made that happen. Yeah. And you have to people, you have to watch the episode because I, I honestly don't know. I could get very animated about this. I could use the best descriptive words. But when I say that this man has painted every inch of his upstairs, including on the books and the bookshelves and the ceiling and the sofa. It, even underneath the sofa cushions. Yes, even in hidden places. <laughs> and it's all in 3D. It's all 3D and he's a brilliant artist and he's a genius. I'm sure he's not from here. Yeah. I don't even understand the level at which he channels information and, and talks about what he does and perceives, but yeah. it's really worth watching. Uh, it, there's nothing like it. I've never seen anything like it. And no. uh, Ruben, you mentioned earlier that in season two, you brought in a friend, colleague, Steve Copeland. Mm-hmm. He's helping out. He has other projects. So that that leads me to ask you this question because mm-hmm. you and Steve were working on film video mm-hmm. called Mission to Maya. And you and the filmmaker, you're on this yeah. sacred journey. You're going yeah. to the highlands of Guatemala. You're going to yeah. go visit a Mayan elder. Yeah. Awesome. You're in the car. You're just sort of filming on your phone as you're getting directions and getting lost about where you're going. Yeah. When all of a sudden, after arriving in Guatemala, you get shot at. And I'm. this is like really seriously shot mm-hmm. at. So <laughs> you talk Wait. about. Tell, tell me what happened and did you ever get to the bottom 
of what occurred and why? <clears throat> uh, on a physical level, no, but spiritually, yes. Hmm. Um, basically, so we had, we had gone down there. Uh, so Steve had produced and directed a film called Shift of the Ages. Uh, came out in 2012. It was sort of following uh, Tata uh, Alejandro, um, who is sort of the main, still is the main Mayan elder of the of the uh, the Mayan people, and. Um, and the documentary sort of goes about his life and his teachings and uh, how he had trouble with this, this, uh, this thousand year old, several thousand year old relic called the corn staff. Um, that was sort of the, the symbol for the Mayan people. And anyways, I highly recommend watching the movie. You can see it on Vimeo for free, Shift of the Ages. So we were kind of shooting around an idea to do a part two of that together. And, he, and, and we had gotten word that Tata was not feeling well and we, we may have had lost him at that time. He was, he was on oxygen and uh, it's not doing so good. So we thought, well, we gotta, we gotta go down there and, and get him on film and perhaps pass the torch, the energetic torch, um, fulfilling the eagle and the condor prophecy. Uh, and we brought uh, Chief Phil Lang, who is of the Dakota tribe and sort of a, a, a major symbol in the, um, for North American uh, indigenous peoples. He, he does a lot of public speaking and, and is out there and, and, and talking about the, the um, prophecies and a lot of the stories from, from the uh, <clears throat> Native American indigenous tribes. So we brought him down and we were able to uh, have them meet and had a ceremony. And there was a lot of weird things happened sort of around that. But as soon as we did it, Chief Phil was like adamant, get me, we gotta go straight to the airport right now, get me on a plane right now. And we're like, Chief, we still got a bunch of filming to do. We can't like, this is all on our own dime. Come on, man, don't do this. And he's like, no, get me, the vultures are coming. They're out to get me, get me on a plane right now. So we literally drove straight from where, from Tazi's house, which is like a three hour, four hour drive to Guatemala City, city took him back to the airport, everyone was exhausted had to do some uh, mind magic to get him on the plane, <laughs> some Jedi magic to get him on the plane because it was before he was supposed to go. And then he was gone and we're like, oh, okay, Whew. all right, now what do you do? So Steve and I were like, well, let's go get some B-roll without him, whatever. So we went back to, we're staying with uh, uh, this woman named Elizabeth who um, is also a Mayan elder and uh, sort of regrouped and then we decided to go out and we were going to go to the pyramids and film some b-roll and on the on the way there uh is when we missed a turn and google rerouted us through you know some neighborhoods and mm. it's the middle of the day it seemed mm. fine uh we were in heavy heavy traffic people everywhere and all of a sudden the back window gets blown out um I thought it was somebody throwing a brick or something from a second story on our roof. I didn't know what was going on. And then uh, in the, in what you see in the video, I thought somebody was after us to get our cameras or something. So I, by instinct, I just threw the camera under the seat. Uh, but what happened right after that was a guy with a gun came running up to the car, trying to get into the car, um, couldn't get in. And then I literally was looking right down the barrel was coming right up to me and that's when i realized this guy's not here to try to get into the car to get the cameras he's here to, to get us <laughs> and that's when i screamed to steve go 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 we were in gridlock traffic steve went on the other side of the street coming head on the traffic we went up on the sidewalk and this guy just unloaded the clip almost at point blank um as we're driving away and luckily the bullets uh, it wasn't right here, but we were in movement, getting uh, peeling out, getting away as he's unloading his clip. And he's shooting inside the car, all this plastic and pieces and stuff. And I felt something hit me in the back. And I was like, oh, shit, am I, <laughs> am I it? And you're like, what's going on here? Adrenaline's going. Steve's peeling out. We're going, you know, this is like a crazy movie um, going over uh, through the traffic going head on against traffic and weeding, weeding the way in and out. We come to a couple stops. I look in the rear view mirror or in, in the side mirror because we can't even see out the back window because it's all broken glass, shattered glass. 
and the guy's just booking it up the hill and with the gun i'm like dude he's still coming it's like the terminator you know you just <laughs> it's like go go steve and he just and then we finally we go down and around and we get into this gridlock stop There's nothing like everything just stopped and it was probably about two three minutes but it felt it was the longest two three minutes of my life looking in the rear view mirror thinking about every scenario that could possibly happen is this if this guy comes around the corner do i we're just sitting ducks we're in the car you know obviously this car is not bulletproof bullets came through <laughs> you know do i do we sit here do i go for a run if i bust out and run is steve gonna be okay you know all these things running through my head uh without words and just like you know, probably you know in the movies when you hear that heartbeat um moment and then the loud um you know that loud uh sound the, the ee, you know that's still going because i'm just point blank bullets just went off in my ear um then luckily traffic starts to move steve muscles his way and we're cutting people off to get in front and then finally we got we got into a main highway and um i kept looking back feeling am i hit am i hit you know and then later we get out and check and a bullet yeah it was just a little metal plate in the seat and then one of the bullets had lodged into that plate so it did tap me in the back but luckily it didn't pierce skin or anything um and uh there, there's another bullet that lodged in to the uh window where if it had been just an entire little one right into my head so kind of looking back at that as okay we had some craziness but some divine protection obviously um those kind of things don't happen I would say you absolutely had divine <laughs> intervention because yeah. you also filmed, I, it looks like the car is somewhere on top of a building finally, somewhere yeah, you're yeah, sequestered. At, at, the, at the car rental return. <laughs> oh my God, can you imagine? Yeah. And we're like, hey, sorry guys. And they're like, sure. they're like, what the hell? And I'm like, does this not happen all the time? Is this a common <laughs> thing? And they're like, no, you're our first customer. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> I can imagine. I, and you know, you're filming the yeah. first, time you've stopped long enough to look at the car and yeah. one of you says i think there's a bullet at the front windshield and the other says no no i don't think so and the other one goes closer and there you are pulling it out and then you go you're navigating the whole car including that back seat i mean that one for me was a gasper because yeah. there is no doubt like a million inch a yeah. million, right a centimeter yeah. And you would have been done for. And so you mentioned that this, you never found out physically, but that mm -hmm. you did spiritually. What did you mean by that? Meaning uh, you found out spiritually what this was about. Well, so when you're, the story of Shift the Ages and the story of, of there, there is, there is a, I think, a natural law to a certain extent to how the this how people are gaining information to these realities in this world, and it's happening in a in, in from one perspective, it's happening in a very controlled, bottlenecked, um, you know, saying the media and these other these outlets that are intentionally uh disseminating the information for the people so to say sort of making up their mind it's not by our free will that we we've we're we're uh this information is being um suppressed for special interest groups and these other things but just like wendy kennedy said it's a soul contract so to another extent to enough from another angle is we signed up to be in this time under these repressive uh oligarchy type um uh rules in the, in this reality um and and when you start pushing against something it's going to push back and i think we were just getting a little too close to some truth like again all truths are true but we're getting a little too close to some some of these ideas and when you start messing with 
um, agendas and uh, people and uh, uh, people in high places and power structures. And I had this with citizen hearing. I had the same thing kind of happen to me. I had some really interesting, strange visitations from government people and these kinds of weird things started happening. And when, and then, you know, my life again, soon fell apart financially right after that due to a bunch of mysterious things, which I won't go into, but there's many angles to how these things play out. And when you start pushing too hard in one direction, you get resistance back. And I feel in that, in that sense, this was a, a nice, uh, adventurous, uh, but yet controlled and divine uh, intervention in the sense that, no, no, th well, this is as far as we need to go. And then Ruben will, Steve will get the lesson and then they can move and shift their focus somewhere else. And don't worry, uh, you know, evil shadow people or whatever is behind the veil on that side. Uh, we, you can continue your work as usual. Ruben and Steve will continue their work somewhere else. Mm. And I felt that that's what that was. So Ruben, here you are, you're a professional, you're paid as a stuntman. Yeah. You're a professional fighter for film and television and video games. You're a video game star. And here you are in a real life situation. It's not a movie, there's not that camera. Did you ever yeah. at any point when the gun is being pointed at you thought, I know martial arts or I know no. a way out of this? No, no, the, the uh, that was, no. No, it's not like in the movies at all. It is definitely, uh, there was a, an amazing amount of fear mm -hmm. and adrenaline rushing through my body uh, at an extremely high rate that um, I wouldn't want to wish on anybody. And, there's, and I don't think there's no amount of training that can prepare you for, for that. Now, there are real, real world experiences when you talk to you know, these people who've been in the wars and been in, um, <clears throat> been in, in different government positions uh, who play that game on a daily basis. So they're more used to having the gun pointed at them. They're used to having, uh, you know, real life fire coming at them from every direction. So I think the more you expose yourself to it, you do get, there's a certain amount of getting used to it and then being able to operate in a more calm fashion under those stresses. But to be honest, uh, my jaw dropped and I was like, what the hell just happened? This is not, this is supposed to be something that only happens in the movies. Mm. And, um, and it took a little bit. I was on high alert, high, high alert for a couple of months after that. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you, did you have PTSD? How did that play out? I did. It, look, I was able to deal with it pretty quick, um, thanks to some medicine journeys. Mm. And, and some. Uh, also, I did a, we did a Mayan uh, fire ceremony right after that, because we were staying with one of the major mind elders. And like, that was one of the big, oh, wow. big uh, uh, reliefs. Like after that, I, I felt really much more grounded and, and centered after that ceremony. But um, I think a, another part of me invited that in so I could understand PTSD a little bit better. And, and uh, because I have on the side, another documentary I'm working on through ayahuasca and the medicine and f been filming some soldiers and people who've dealt with PTSD. So now I can relate to them uh, as a filmmaker uh, much better uh, having gone and, and feeling and going through those experiences myself. So, um, so anyways, I think there's a reason for all of this in many ways, but uh, on that level, for sure, uh, having to deal with those, with that, uh, that type of trauma um, and then in processing it. And, you know, it's something that will always live with me, obviously, I'll, I'll probably, uh, but, but now I can, you know, it's, it's more of like, oh, yeah, that happened. I forgot that happened. Yeah, thanks for <laughs> you know, bringing it up. And I'm not scared of talking about it or anything. It's not, I'm not traumatized in a negative way. I'm like, oh, yeah, it happened. It was, and uh, it was just fascinating. And here we are. We're talking about it. Well, thanks for sharing that. Sure. I'm sorry you went through that. No, no, I'm, I'm happy I went through it. Hmm. Um, 
because again, it allows me this, this uh, different perspective on, on things that I can see now having gone through that. And, and at the end of the day, it was just insurance money out of the car. It was, took six months to get the insurance money, but uh, it was a lot of, but, and there was a lot of that, you know, more, I'm more traumatized trying to get my insurance money than actual the trauma from the shooting. But at the end of the day, nobody was hurt that I know. I don't know, hopefully uh, no stray bullets hit anybody on the street, but uh, I wasn't hurt. Steve wasn't hurt. Um, you know, who knows about the, the guy that pulled the trigger, what, what he's dealing with. Um, but that, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's the truth is nobody was hurt. So yeah, life goes on. What is something Ruben, we don't know about you? What's something surprising or interesting about you that you can share? Hmm. Surprise. Well, uh, I got to work with, uh, James Cameron and Peter Jackson and Steven Spielberg um, and one of my favorite cartoons, by the way, I grew up as a child because my father was Austrian, very European, Belgian and all that. Yeah, Tintin. Hey, uh, Tintin. Well, I was working on set on Tintin doing some of the tests and, I was, and it was me and one other stunt actor working with Andy Serkis. Mm -hmm. And I had all three directors right there in this intimate setting taught, working the scene, you know, we're doing the scene together. And I'm like, what? it doesn't get any better than this you can't as an actor the, the pinnacle of my acting career still will be that moment when all three directors are exchanging notes and working with this technology and i'm working with peter jackson and and uh uh spielberg and andy circus and just seeing the level of professionalism and respect and mutual respect they all had for each other and uh and craft that went into making the scene uh i was like yep doesn't get any better than this That's mm. did you did you ever try to play it really cool and like try to do a selfie with them in the background i i so the stunt coordinator he uh he wanted that those types of things those types of pictures and things for me i just i was like whatever this is it is what it is but i actually got in trouble because he ordered me He's the one who brought me on. So in a sense, I kind of, I was indebted to him. So he says, Ruben, here, here's the camera, take some pictures, you know? So I'm taking pictures of him, you know, and then I get yelled at, of course. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> busted. <laughs> busted. <laughs> so, Funny, you know, you mentioned that when you were a kid, you were a nerd, not into sports yeah. at all. So when you say you were a nerd, what kind of nerd are we talking about? Were you like, a book nerd? Were you a, a gamer comic, nerd? Comic books and games. Yeah, those were the two. Uh, huge, huge Street Fighter fan. I play. I used to go to the arcades and play, not professionally, but I'd go and look for for challenges in the at the arcade for the strongest Street Fighter player. And read a lot of comic books, mostly Japanese manga comics that are popular now. Um, and uh yeah i was very much a nerd in the sense that i didn't i wasn't a jock didn't play any sports never did any drugs stayed away from parties just hung out with my uh nerd friends and we just nerd out on you know on <laughs> on comics and video games <laughs> do you think it paid off do you think having oh, been oh, like that like oh, funneled yeah. into who you are today absolutely because now i get so i used to go to these Anime. I don't know. Are you familiar with the anime Comic Con culture? Somewhat, yeah. Okay, Not so as probably as deep as you. <laughs> these conventions have gotten huge. huge. Like Comic Con is just yeah. off the charts, and, and this year has been a sad year for, yeah. for that industry. Yeah. But um, so I used to go. I used to pay money and go to Dragon Con. This is in Atlanta, mm. and uh, some of these smaller conventions, and just the nerd out, you know, to play the role playing, to play Dungeons and Dragons, and the to, to to see the get the autographs of these people that most people don't know or care about but it's like oh that's the creator of you know the whatever whatever uh or you know seeing some of the star trek actors you know and you're like oh my god that's god from star trek it's so cool you know um and uh or even the writer like oh that's the writer it's the writer from this comic book series you know 
in a normal world, these people aren't really big celebrities, but in that world, they're huge. So what's interesting is now I'm one of those people. Now I get invited to these conventions because of my work in video games and films. Um, I go to these conventions and I sign autographs and I'm, um, I'm seeing myself 20, 30 years ago uh, as these people are coming up to me and asking me for my autographs. So in that sense, it's gone full circle. And I'm just like, yeah, and I totally can resonate with those people because I've been there. That's where, that's where I got my roots. And that's what, that was my driving force for becoming the person I am and going and doing the investigations and moving to Japan, learning martial arts and doing, you know, having the ET stuff too. Cause now I get invited to ED, uh, UFO conventions as well. So I'm like in that camp and I'm over here in this camp, <laughs> got all these different uh, camps that I'm hanging out in. And one, and I would just wish these people knew about if this world knew about this world oh my god if that world knew about my world oh my god it would be what an amazing world this would be but we're getting there slowly so i hope to be a bridge between a lot of these worlds and that's a, a lot of my work and focus in um what i do is is again I, I think we can all get along and have a good time uh if we just see each other's worlds from a different perspective I'm so glad you came on the show today. I'm very grateful to have you on. So first, I just want to say thank you so much, Ruben, for sharing yourself and your vision and your work out into the world. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And so for people who are watching, who are listening, there is going to be a part two. You can tell there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, Ruben was just mentioning bridging worlds. So we're going to do even more of that because he's brought up things like doing medicine ceremony. And I want to deep dive into that and a little bit of his Japanese background culture um, and all of that and more and even more. So stick around for those of you who are ready for part two. And for those of you who are listening on radio, you'll have to look us up for part two. If you want to learn more about him, go to rubenlangdon.com. Subscribe to Dare to Dream podcast. This is your number one transformation conversation. My guest next week is Scarlett Raven. She is a plant spirit channel and a starseed visionary. Her newest book is Psilocybin Transmission, a channeled book from the spirit of psilocybin. Scarlett's company is White Fox Medicinals, serving high vibrational organic medicine to people through award-winning win medicinal products. I mean, she's been written up in um, major, major magazines and papers. And so this is a legit big time company with herbs, with CBD, with cannabis, with psilocybin since 2007. And her tools are all about creating wholeness. If you love the show, tell your friends and family, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for leaving a comment. We adore you for it. And I do read everything that you leave for me. And I end today's show with this quote from the Dalai Lama. We Buddhists have always held that firm conviction that there exists life and civilization on other planets in the many systems of the universe. And some of them are so highly developed that they are superior to our own. Thanks for listening to Dare to Dream. Welcome to part two, I'm Debbie Dashinger. This is the Dare to Dream podcast. I have been on air and on podcasts for over 13 years. Thank you for making the show what it is today. And thank you always for subscribing, letting people know about the show, leaving us reviews. And I do read all your comments. I really appreciate it. My guest, this is a part two series. I have back Ruben Langdon. We've already been having some magnificent conversation. He's a Los Angeles, Tokyo-based actor, filmmaker, truth seeker, and uh, he's had quite an illustrious career. Currently, Ruben is the host of Gaia TV Network show Interview with Extra Dimensionals. You can find out more about him at rubenlangdon.com. And Ruben, I welcome you back to the show. It's so great to still be with you. Yes. Let's continue the conversation. It's been fun. Yeah, I feel like we're just getting started. You brought up things that I 
I'm very excited to talk about. So I want to do some deep diving with you, if you're comfortable, to mm -hmm. talk about the world of ayahuasca mm -hmm. and medicine in general. Mm -hmm. So, okay, my friend, if you would, you've already said you've done it, but yes. um, let's talk about how did grandmother find you? How did she tap, tap, tap? And what got you interested? Well, I think mostly it's, uh... I think we do the finding in a sense, uh, I guess it's a two-way pump. Um, for me, I had on my journey as far as the extraterrestrial work, I'm discovering that there's more to reality than what we've been uh, dished up, so to say, in, the, in our society and in, in media. Um, and all this was sort of happening to me while I was working on the film Avatar. Mm -hmm. um, I was, my whole world paradigm was shifting uh, for a few reasons. One, I was, uh, my job was to be a Navi, to be a indigenous uh, alien uh, from another world um, with uh, different belief systems and, and ideas than sort of the military visitors that were mining this, this, uh, this ore for, for power. And I was there as a Navi to help. So simultaneously, I was there playing a Navi to help Jake Sully go through his journey to understand who the Navi were. I was also the main double for Jake Sully. So I was playing the guy learning what this reality was. So I was having to be a teacher and a student in the same movie. <laughs> and, uh, and constantly flipping roles daily, you know, okay, who am I today? You know, and you're wearing a motion capture suit. So it's just a sticker that says today I'm Navi or today I'm stunt Jake. And, uh, and that's, that's what determined which role I was going to wear that day. And some days I'd be both. Um, so I was constantly flipping back and forth. And as the Navi, um, we had to, we had to become indigenous teachers. Uh, because that's the role we're playing. So in order to, to uh, inhabit that role, and you, you know, as an actress, you do as much homework as you can on, uh, on the role you're playing, and you try to find out as much as you can. And, and, and Cameron was very adamant about us learning as much as we could about indigenous cultures, because the Navi were modeled after indigenous cultures. And I first found out about this sacred ceremony called ayahuasca while actually on the set of Avatar. Um, there was a scene that was cut. You can go online and I think if you do a search, you can find this scene that was uh, rendered out uh, in, without the beautiful graphics, but in a really low res graphics, um, <clears throat> where Jake has to take a uh, psychedelic worm and he goes on a journey. And I remember I was part of the group capturing the, uh, the journey, being in the, in the audience, so to say, to, to hold space for Jake as he went on this journey. To, and this was part of his initiation to become a Navi. So, uh, so Karen came on set and explained, okay, here's what we're doing. This is based off this, this indigenous um, from South America. They do this in the Amazon, it's called ayahuasca. It's a psychedelic tea that they pass around and it's in a circle and they do this thing. And um, I was like, okay, that's fascinating. That's interesting. Uh, and that's the first time I heard about it. So I played the Navi and I did that. And then I saw Jake go through his journey. So that sparked my curiosity. Okay, is this, this is based on something real. This exists in our reality, in our, in our, in our society somewhere out there, right? So I started doing some more research and found out a fellow stuntman of mine named Tra Trampus had, um, had been quite vocal of his uh, ayahuasca experiences and was recommending other people in the industry, stunt industry, to go and try it. So I was like, well, he, this guy knows something. Let me go talk to him. This was back in like 2009-ish, eight, nine, well, nine, 10. The movie had already come out and I knew someday I was gonna do it. And I was like, and, and take it, this is, I was still in nerd mode. So I had done zero, I hadn't smoked pot. I'd barely been drunk. I'd never done any psychedelic type uh, drugs uh, in my life. Uh, so this was sort of a big deal for me because I uh, 
for me being a stuntman and, and all about focus, mm. it was all about control and losing control over my body or even my mind was something that actually didn't interest me at all. Um, but I was going, I wanted to explore this reality because the more I researched psychedelics, the more I researched, particularly ayahuasca, um, I realized that it's, it's not this, it's not about losing your mind or going, you know, uh, you know, crazy or whatever, or, or getting high in a sense that, um, that we had been sort of told through society that that's what drugs are used for, you know, you're just going to get high. So, uh, so I took a lot of, did more research, interviewed him, talked, discussed, and then eventually, um, I had signed up to go down to the Sacred Valley in PSAC in, uh, and to, in, in Peru to go and experience this, 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 uh, this ayahuasca ex experience. Uh, lo and behold, this was right after I had my run-ins with government and other things and citizen hearing and I lost my business and I was sort of uh, following what breadcrumbs I could to survive and I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, and through some friends and synchronicities, even though I had signed up to go to PSAC, I didn't have the funds to do it. At that same time, it would have been the same time, uh, I got a call from a friend saying, hey, I have some friends doing ceremony. Um, would you be interested in enjoying? It's a sort of an underground ceremony thing. And I said, yes actually that's it's funny you called i was wanting to have this experience at this time and i just couldn't afford it financially and and grandmother brought it to my door so that's how that happened and uh i really don't want to go into more detail because i don't want you know this is still schedule one substance 100%. and uh and we have to honor those mm -hmm. who are doing this work uh underground and in private yeah. Uh, but essentially, uh, it is, that's what it is. This is amazing work. And the fact that the FDA continues to classify uh, DMT, mescaline, uh, psilocybin, and, uh, and even THC as a scheduled one substance, that in itself is criminal. And the big hats off to Oregon for decriminalizing these substances and yes. being the way showers for the rest of the United States uh, moving forward. So, and I'm sure you have many guests. It sounded like your upcoming guest uh, is already uh, well, well in this uh, world of um, uh, the powers of these medicines and these experiences when used correctly. Now I do uh, believe that they can be misused and they, and they are very powerful tools mm -hmm. that need supervision and people who are responsible and have had um, the training and experiences to mm. hold the space that needs to be held when uh, these sacred plant medicines are ah, uh, ingested. I'm so with you. I'm so with you. I get invited. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have a problem with invitations, mm -hmm. but I have a problem with barometer. And I just measure, you know, I always do my research. Mm -hmm. Is this person a shaman? How long? I mean, I want to know way details. Where was this brood? Who brewed it? What, situ what is the situation? Or what kind of helpers do we have? What is the location? Yeah. I mean, it's very important. This is my consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I know when I'm going into ceremony, I want that time, that money, that commitment, that experience to count. Mm -hmm. And it, and I am very protective of myself. So, you know, no greater words were spoken than what you just said. So, you know, you mentioned DMT. That's the psychoactive component of ayahuasca. Awesome. Correct. So where, and you mentioned going to Peru, where else in the world, Ruben, have you done medicine? So what countries? Uh, I've only done it in the United States. Hmm. Not even in Peru. Oh, so this friend called you. Mm -hmm. You have this opportunity, but you don't have the funds. And you say, mm -hmm. funny you should call. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how grandmother orchestrated that one. That's right. Um, or my higher self or whatever other, the ETs or the other energies uh, orchestrated that synchronicity for that to happen at that time. 
Um, cause this, they had something I had been planning for two years, uh, it was to go, to go down to the jungle and I signed up for the thing. And, um, I, but because of what I was going through financially, all my funds got stripped away. So I couldn't afford the trip. Uh, and I had to cancel it. And, uh, and yeah, through synchronicities at that time, I had sort of forgotten about it because I, you know, so much had happened, uh, with, with the finances and stuff that it was just like so off my radar it was like that's not going to happen anytime soon and then it happened so when you seek it when you set your mind to uh that you want to spend time with grandmother and you're like there and you're not like scared or afraid or maybe or whatever it will come at the exact right time when you need it I think you can be afraid. I'm always, I have no idea. uh, uh, Afraid is one thing, but afraid of there's, there's fear of change in a good way. And then there's just fear in the sense that uh, of the unknown um, because it's unknown and, and there's other, you know, other there's, I guess there's different levels and different types of fear. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sort of, I'm an anomaly. I don't even understand myself, but I accept myself, but I'm, I, I'm really fear-based about a lot of things, but I'm also this huge risk taker. Go figure. Last time I drank, um, it really came up for me, you know, cause we're in the middle of this really weird situation. So I'm, I was actually doing a socially distancing ceremony. So, um, and I was, I was scared, like a lot of fear came up and it was about my time to get up and grab the cup. And I asked myself the question that makes sense to me in my world in which I really appreciate it. Sort of like the Debbie question, you're at a crossroads, what are you gonna do? Cause I literally know if I keep going down this path with the fear that is increasingly becoming more real and voracious, I know I'll go head first into panic. Or you could jump. Yep. I mean, it's like, seems crazy to pose that to yourself, but it's like, literally I got myself here. There's a reason. And I'll always go, yeah, okay. We're going to jump. <laughs> well, that's, that's the analogy I use for society right now in our political and, and, and uh, social economic role, you know, reality that we find ourselves in right now is we basically there uh, for the people who are still in it. And I don't consider you and I still in it per se, because we're, we're kind of doing our own thing. We're, you know, we're, we're bypassing that reality. But there are many people who are stuck in that reality, in the, in the polarized reality, I say, in the political polarity, the economic polarity, the just plain old polarity. Uh, that are so full of fear and rage. And I think one feeds the other, more more the fear feeds the rage than anything else. And this idea of hopelessness and this, this, this not knowing the future, this uncertainty and this, eventually when you're in that, you, there's basically, like you said, there's two ways, there's two choices you can, you can choose. You can continue to go down that path and, it, and we know where it leads. It leads to more of the same and to, until ultimately you just self-destruct. That's because you cannot, it's not a non-sustainable uh, emotion, a non-sustainable energy to, to, to continue down this path. Or you can unplug from that reality and do something completely different. And, and that's the crossroads humanity is on this global scale right now is we all individually can unplug from this nonsense of polarity or continue down that reality and we know where it leads. Yeah, yeah, for people who don't know, I mean, it's, it's, this is a pretty prevalent conversation and subject these days, but there are still people who haven't known or may have heard or may be scared. So I'll just give you like a little bit of background before we go on. So ayahuasca, is sometimes known as the tea or the vine or la purga. And it is brewed. It's literally plant material that's brewed. It's the leaves of a shrub. It's along with a stalks of a vine. And aya, A-Y-A means 
soul or ancestors and huasca means vine or rope. So when you put it together, it's basically vine of the soul. Pretty cool. Um, this is ancient stuff. We are just in this modern world-ish coming into this. It's becoming more prevalent. I think, um, I believe the ancestors said there would come a time when it would go out into the world, uh, much less held on to by the tribes and more into the world. So traditionally, what we're talking about is that there is a shaman, there is a cordero, Corandero is how you say it. There's somebody who is um, very knowing, who is an experienced healer of sorts and will lead the ayahuasca ceremony. They brew, they prepare the brew. So I understand because you and I spent a lunch together, Ruben, that you actually made ayahuasca brew you had an experience without going into where you did it or anything i'm not interested in that but talk about your involvement start to finish what was that like uh well it was um great connecting to that so uh, i was lucky enough to be able to pick the chicken leaves uh, directly off the plant and then find the ayahuasca vine in the jungle and then um, pound the vine and uh, say prayers over the whole process and then you it's a cooking process so you have to there's different layers and then you cook you cook the uh, the leaves and the vine in uh, this brew soup you know uh, and you have to cook it down over days and days and days it, it, it's a slow cooking process and you're constantly stirring and you're constantly putting your intention in every time you stir it and the other people who this are, is your intention or is this like a global intention or for the ceremony participants it's both it's both so all the above so you you put your intention for what you want to get out of it personally you put the intention of what you know you know other people are going to be drinking this brew not just you because it's a big it's a big brew it's a big uh tub of of aya for for our group and for for going out for the others so um so you the and that's the idea this is what they do do in the jungles too you know this is what uh the idea of uh intention is such an important part of the ayahuasca process uh, and you know this even taking part in the circle in the medicine circle you set your intention before you go in um you, you you when you're in those states you're constantly reminding yourself of the intention you set before going in and you're getting messages usually around that sort of intention so intention is a big part of the ayahuasca experience including the making of the medicine and putting the intention of uh, and we know about cymatics and how that works and dr emoto and his work and I'm, I'm sure you've discussed that on your show um, so we know how intention can affect the vibrational frequency of a molecular structure of something as simple as water. And when we have the already, the, the, the plant medicine intention, there's a, there's a genetic archetype, uh, with that grandmother spirit. That's part of the vine. That's part of the chacruna leaves. That's already part of thousand years of lineage, lineage of of um, indigenous using this to heal and all of that intention is already built into the dna and molecular structure of the vine and of the the plants themselves and then now you're adding your intention the group is adding their intention the shamans are adding their attention so a lot of powerful intention goes into making this stuff uh and some brews are different than others maybe not as much intention or whatever and you can always sort of reset the molecular intention and this is what you do when you hold the cup and you put your intention into it as you're praying over it before you take the drink so any sort of negative intention that may have been put into it for whatever reason that you didn't see you can always restructure the uh the brew right there and redo it um just before you drink it but with that said we made some powerful medicine <laughs> and uh and it's a very humbling experience. It's like right now I'm growing my garden and, uh, you know, winter's coming in and it's hard to grow a little bit, but all summer I was eating the salad that came out of the garden. You know, every day I'm having an abundance of salad and oh my God, there's so much salad and there's so much veggies and greens and good stuff and Swiss chard and 
uh, kale. And when you, when you consume the fruits of your labor in the sense of a food or a drink or any type of something like that, um, you really, it, like it tastes so much better. And then you, have, you want to invite people, come eat it, you know, this is good stuff, you know, and then there's a, there's a, there's an intention that went into the garden, the plants, you know, every day we're watering it. And as, as you know, my wife and I are watering the garden and mostly her with the soil stuff. I have a hydroponics machine. I'm a little disconnected because I've got other stuff going on and just like, just put the nutrients in there and it'll do its thing. But no, she's in there sending love to all the plants, watering them daily. And with every water, she's sending powerful intention of this food is going to provide us with nutrients that we need. And that disconnect that has happened through our food supply and through many things in our life, what the, what the ayahuasca ceremony teaches us is how we can incorporate that back into our lives yeah. and how intention for self-production, uh, for our own sovereignty, you know, having a garden, or creating whatever we're going to create and put out into the world to have that intention to know that it's not only going to feed you, but it's also going to nurture and feed the rest of society and the world. And everything we choose to do in our life should be uh, built. This intention can be built and restructured into how we operate in this world. And it's I think that's truly really grassroots without a doubt. How yeah. long from start to finish did it take to actually create the brew? About five days. Five days. How many yeah. hours every day? Well, it's constantly boiling. It's boiling. You know, the first day is really the hard work of pounding the vine, getting the leaves. Well, I guess picking, if you had that, it'd be another day of picking. But you can get it started and going, and then you set it up. And then you just cook it for, you know, five. it's a five-day cook, cook-down process. So, and we're going in. So we would mix it, spend about, you know, 20, 30 minutes a day, each of us mixing and putting intention. Some of us would do it more, but it, it needed to be constantly burnt, mixed and cooked. So mm. so before I ask the next question, yeah. let me ask this. How many times have you drunk? How many times have you ingested medicine? -ish? Well, I've, I've had a different types of medicine, but uh, primarily the AYA uh, has been, a, I, I would say over 20 times. Okay, fantastic. So of the 20 times you've done ayahuasca, how was this different? The experience of then taking it in ceremony and experiencing it than what you had had previously, or was there a difference? Well, there was definitely that, that deep appreciation of the work, of this type of work. And um, not only my own intention, but the shamans and the people who do this, this work and go throughout the world carrying this, this ancient technology, again, using that word, I think it's a technology, uh, and carrying it through um, and, and creating a delivery service, <laughs> in a sense, to people who need it across the world. Um, it's, just, it's just a very powerful modality uh, that is so needed on the planet at this time. And I think that shamans know this and that's why they've, they've allowed it to go out. They know this is the time for this work and that it's a two-way pump, meaning that the people have to be reset, re ready to receive it as well. So they, they're very good. The shamans are very good at reading energy and knowing uh, timing of things. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so yes, on that sense, just the huge amount of gratitude for the modality itself um and obviously taking that to the next level for being uh you know experiencing the whole journey from the picking of the vine to the intention and the prayer and to uh to the delivery system to finally ending up in ceremony you know a week later uh where that medicine is being used um for my own healing you know, just that whole process is in the appreciation and gratitude for the process. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the importance of the shamans. It's really, it really is everything. I mean, they're the ones who are going to offer spiritual guidance mm -hmm. and they work on a lot of different levels as well during a ceremony. I'll tell you something funny you were mentioning about 
what gets put into the cup and holding the cup and having the intention. I, I did an excursion out of country and it was four back-to-back -back ceremonies. I was definitely I was so scared, uh, but I did it and it was amazing. And by the fourth night, they brought in a Colombian shaman. And Ruben, we met with him in the daytime when he was describing, oh, tonight you're gonna have yahe. So I'll tell you right up front, pretty much have the bucket, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but try to keep it inside of you if you can. 30 mm -hmm. minutes, definitely an hour is even better. So the medicine can take place. And then if you need to purga, go mm -hmm. for it because it's actually things inside of you. And their contention was that the water molecules in the body, speaking of Dr. Emoto, that there are water molecules in the body that hold trauma. Mm -hmm. And that those water molecules will literally release them from the body. Yep. So for anyone listening who hasn't done it, and I know, cause I was also scared, like, oh, throwing up. It actually is this relief. You know, something toxic that you've been living with has now exited. Mm -hmm. So all of that to say, um, it's Yahe night. And I was in, oh my goodness, just thinking about it. I was having a panic attack mm -hmm. and I, everybody was in line waiting to get their cup of brew. I had already expressed how very nervous I was in the daytime to the shaman. And so I went up, I got my cup. Yes, it was disgusting, but drank my water, cleaned my mouth, went back. And all I could think was sitting on my mattress, just hold it in, just hold it in, just hold it in. So here I was the one person like having a mage panic attack. And so I will say that after an hour, definitely a lot was released from my body in a lot of ways. <laughs> And what is amazing, because you don't know how these things are going to occur. You literally don't know what the journey is going to be like. When I heard the call for the second cup, I checked inside mm -hmm. and I was like, do we go up? And I heard spirit tell me very definitively, yes, we're mm -hmm. getting a second cup. All right. So I go up, <laughs> I'm waiting in line, very short line at this point, And the shaman Leo looks at me like, cause he knew like you were the one with the panic attack. Yeah. And he asked me some questions cause he's not gonna just hand over brew, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, why? What do you wanna get out of this? And I looked at him and I said, I have been dealing with fear my whole life and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm here cause I'm ready to get rid of it. Can we put that into the cup, please? Because mm -hmm. I am so done with that experience. And he was, <laughs> He was fully on board, turned around, got the cup, filled it up, boom, down it went. Yep. So the great thing is, I have to say, I would say, I, I don't know what percentage is gone from my life, but it's massive what got lifted from me that night, that intention, and I have never had to experience again. Mm. But I also, just because it's a fun story, will tell you that as the night went on and I still la purgad, a lot, mm -hmm. and I had divine experiences like beyond. That third cup call, I was a three cupper that night. Wow. So I wow. thought it was rather hilarious and amazing yeah. all at once that the person having the panic attack would yeah. be told by spirit over and over, yes, we're going back. Yes, yeah. we're not done yet. And to just trust the process, you know? You talk about weaponizing your curiosity. You talked about that in part one of our, our interview. And there's something to that about, you know, the curious mind, the curious being allowing energy and experience to lead them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have you had anything similar that was a big surprise to you? Well, since we're on the subject of curiosity, one of the things that I've sort of some re recent downloads around that is that if we all remain curious and open-minded and in that exploratory um, mindset um, without judgment, but simply trying to understand. And you may not figure it out, but if you stay in that state of trying to understand the other, mm. the other can be anything, the plant, the, the bug, the animal, the other person, the ET, 
the, the, the other religion, whatever it is, as long as you're trying to understand, and again, and this gets into empathy and empathizing with people uh, and the things and everything in all of life, but, it, but really what empathy is, 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 what is empathy? Empathy is just you're trying to understand. You, know, you may not understand, that's okay. It's the act of trying to understand the other. That's empathy. That's what it is. Um, not sympathy, because when you sympathize with someone, you're actually falling to their level and you're agreeing with them uh, on whatever level they're at, not allowing any type of out from where they're at. So you, you get stuck in a rut. That's what sympathy is. Empathy is the curiosity of you trying to understand still allows the other person, if they're in a rut or whatever, to see that you're trying to peer into their world and then that your world is different than their world. So that gives them a shining light to follow if they choose to go there. So you're, you're always giving them uh, an out, so to say, by simply trying to understand. Um, and it's up to you whether, well, it's not up to you, whether you get it or not, in a sense, it's up to you, but it's not necessary. And this is one of the biggest downloads I got was you don't have to figure it out in order for the mechanism of curiosity to work. Does that make sense? It really makes sense. And I'm wondering, post that download, mm -hmm. how did that impact your marriage? Were you married at the time? And how did you come yeah, back? Yeah, and this, is, this is all pretty recently. This is like the past mm -hmm. four months. Like I've always been curious and I've always wanted, you know, I've always, that's just been who I am, but to understand the mechanism of curiosity and how it works and being able to explain it in this way was really just the past couple of months. And it was like a big aha moment. And this is part of why on my show, I offer the buffet I offer. I actually don't understand all of the channelers that I put on. I understand them <laughs> to a certain extent. <laughs> <laughs> to a certain extent and I resonate with others like as you know Lisa who I've had on the show many times because I really resonate with them but others I some of it just goes over my head and I'm just what are they saying I'm, I'm trying you know and I'm trying to understand and it was it was a, a channel or recently that I interviewed that I was like I just don't get it <laughs> but you know that's okay it's okay and that's what the, the download was you don't have to get it just by the curiosity people will watch the show and see my curiosity because it's genuine. My curiosity is genuine. I'm trying to understand some of these teachings and some of these realities and some of these, how this works. I'm, I don't get it at all. But that act of trying is all, is it's opening the door and it gives other people, they can see, they'll be able to see the episode as this guy's trying to understand it. And if anything, if I don't get any of it either, at least what I do get is the act of trying to understand another is how we break down all the walls, all the barriers, all the wars. We can have peace on the planet if we all just simply try to understand another. We don't have to understand one another. We just have to try and make the effort. Hmm. Interesting. So the difference between sympathy and empathy. Yeah, understood. And what else in your buffet? Of outside of your show, the buffet of what you've done. I'm assuming yeah. San Pedro mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, all of it. Have you done the 20 minute DMT? I've attempted it. It it, it didn't work for me. Huh. Uh, smoke and I don't get a, smoke and I don't get along very well. So I've never been high off of smoking marijuana or smoking anything in that sense. And I've and I've attempted to to try the smoke the uh administered dmt straight in that sense of a few times actually and it shaman cut me off because i after about five doses and five you know he was like uh yeah this is not working I, i'm cutting you off <laughs> so it's like okay that's it it's understandable <laughs> oh that's bully for you you really did try that's well yeah it's, it's not that i'm i don't know maybe i'm superhuman or something i think there's just my body and smoke don't get along in a sense. So my body rejects any type of smoke. Uh, really, if I try to inhale and, and mm. a cigarette or even any kind of tobacco or even marijuana, I, I'll go into a coughing fit for about uh. an hour and it's, it's very unpleasant. Uh, vapor, vapes, I, I can 
take them without the cough, but I'm not feeling any of the um, effects of it. So okay. my, my lungs, I think it's just me and my lungs don't say, nope, not there. We're not doing that. <laughs> you mentioned uh, Lisa on the mm -hmm. part one of this interview, as well as here, Lisa Royal Holt. And uh, so she does exquisite work. Mm -hmm. And I know she's been on your show a couple of times. She's soon to come up on, on season three. So mm -hmm. you meet her. What and I want to be really clear with the audience with this question. I want to, the question is, what is your relationship with her? But Ruben is married, so we're not going there. Yeah. And Lisa's got an amazing husband, Ron Holt, who's extremely gifted in his own right. He'll so, also be in season three. Who, yes, who will also about quantum navigation, right? Yep. Which is, I've had an experience of, holy moly. And I want to know though, because that's kind of cool when somebody comes on your show and you interview them and it could just be one thing like a, a meet and greet and thank you very much. But instead, some it seems that something else has happened. So talk a little bit about your relationship with Lisa. Well, when I first you know, started the series, I was I uh, began with the people I knew, uh, Wendy, I reached out to Gerald, he was busy at the time. Um, and we ended up doing getting his interview for for season two um but nora um rob gothier had come recommended so all of these i, I sort of like one step led to the no, another and i would talk to people or interview people and then they would give me recommendations and i was just kind of going by that synchronicities or i'd check somebody out and oh this person seems you know they'd show up on my youtube feed or whatever and this person seems I resonate with the message enough to pursue that and, and, and try to get them on the show. And that's sort of just the, the, the breadcrumbs we keep saying um, that I've been following during this whole process. So, you know, I'd known Lee prior to even starting the show and uh, it just seemed like it fit. Uh, I would known uh, Adam Apollo also before uh, the show and he just seemed like a fit for the show. So some, some people I'd already known, some people were new, some people were recommendations. Uh, and I just, uh, Lisa was a well-known channeler, one of the more well-known ones, especially when it came to the ET uh, storyline. So many people had recommended, had, oh, you should check out Lisa, you should check out Lisa. So eventually I, I reached out to her and I said, hey, Lisa, I've got the show I'm doing. And she, uh, in a sense, like with you, a little bit of reluctancy, um, had to do her own homework and, and and figure out and then it felt good and then and then uh i was able to go to her um house in phoenix and interview her and it turned out during the interview we had a lot of synchronicities as far as the ties and relationships to japan uh that was actually that interview was just uh, about two weeks before i actually met my wife uh so it's funny because right after that literally a week after that interview i went to japan for work uh, three and a half, four years ago, almost, uh, almost four, four years ago now, and then met my wife in Japan. Uh, and then we, uh, I guess you could say dated for a year or so, and then decided to get married. And now uh, we've been married for three years. So the, the synchronicities because of, J of Japan and Lisa's work with the Japanese people. And I've been to a couple of contact retreats out in Japan and just, there's a lot of, overlap with with that and in, in, in uh, our journey in that sense. And, and we really have a, a synchronicity and connection to the Japanese culture. You're mentioning a lot of the people you've had on the show. And uh, I don't know how much is in the can for season three, or if you're quite in process with that. What is what haven't you done yet that you would really like to see happen on interview with extra dimensional? Well, I always joke that the, the last episode or maybe the first episode of whatever, you know, season 20 or wherever we're at at that point is, um, will be an interview on a ship with mm -hmm. an ET in, in, in uh, an actual physical ET uh, in whatever camera gear we have at that time to be able to capture that, that moment. Um, I, I joke that that's, that's what you know, it's, it's, it's going to get there. We're going to get to that spot where I'm actually finally interviewing an actual physical being. Uh, so 
that's that gives you an idea of what I have in mind for where we're headed with this. But um, any guests you haven't had on that you'd really like love bucket list <clears throat> to interview? Um, I think they're all slated for season three. <laughs> so, oh, stay tuned. Um, you know, uh, we're, I'm in talks with with Esther, um, mm -hmm. Esther Hicks and Abraham. Abraham. So that would probably be like one of the big, you know, the big names that that I think would be cool to have of that level. You know, obviously we had Daryl on the show already, um, so we'll we'll see where things go. But um, if not, uh, you know, I I think after season three, I, there's some other projects that I need I wanted to focus on. So I'm probably going to put a little uh, pause on things. Um, just to get these other projects in the can and then maybe something I can pick up later. But we'll, we'll see where the popularity of the show goes. We'll see if, if, if Gaia decides to take, whether they decide to take a season three or not. Um, I, I just, I've committed myself to finish a season three uh, and either self-distribute or um, there there's, uh, seems to be a lot of interest from other uh, distributors as well. So we'll see how that all plays out. But um, for sure there will be a season three. So you mentioned Japan. Mm -hmm. I know you've had a lot of career in Japan in the past. Mm -hmm. Your wife is from Japan. Yes. How, talk about Japan in your life. What does that country mean? How did you learn the language? Not easy to learn. Well, I had, since a kid, I had this fascination with Japan uh, through you know, the Asian culture. Past life. Probably past life, of course, yeah. Just Asian culture in general fascinated me. Mm. Ninjas and samurais and, mm. um, and then I got into the anime and the manga uh, with, you know, Japanese comics, which then really gave me a, a, a deeper look into that society through their lens because they, they have these stories that they create in comics but a lot of cultural influences are uh, portrayed in these comics, you know, just like Americans have Marvel comics and we have an American culture through Captain America, you know, and Spider-Man and all of these things. You can really get an idea of what the American psyche is just by looking at our at our comics and at our storytelling. So I was looking through that lens of storytelling through the Japanese um, comic book world and anime. And I was just fascinated with the culture, just growing up through junior high and, and into high school and, and video games. At the time, most of the predominant main video games, successful ones were coming from Japan. You know, we had the Nintendo and the Genesis and the Sega Genesis and then the PlayStation and, um, and all of our, you know, Final Fantasy and all the, the, the most cutting edge games were coming out of Japan. So that really sparked my interest. And I was like, I got to get there. There's something about this culture that I need to need to experience. And I need to, to it's a part of me already, but I need to go deeper. So, uh, you know, at the age of 19, uh, it was several years in the making. It wasn't just on a whim, but I had saved up some money and bought a plane ticket and decided to go to Japan. And when I got there, I fell in love immediately with all aspects of it and uh, ended up staying and I lived there for five, five years with a, a year, or almost two years back and forth to Hong Kong. Um, and um, then eventually moving back to the States in, in uh, 1999. And you did a ton of commercials while you were there. Yeah, I did you a ton of commercials. You were like this yeah. adorable, uh, <laughs> Prince Charming, blonde haired, white boy. Yeah, um, yeah. That's tons of Japanese commercials. Yeah, if I had done that body of work of commercials in America, I'd be a very well-off rich guy right now. But uh, in Japan, they don't have residuals. Uh, the market is quite a bit smaller than, than the US market. So I got paid usually a couple hundred bucks per commercial and and uh but it was fun and that's how i paid my bills while living there while i was studying martial arts and training um the bills got paid through that type of work through doing commercials and modeling amazing okay so what do you do today what do you do today rob Ru ruben besides medicine <laughs> <laughs> well, i don't do medicine every day 
<laughs> what do you do on a daily basis that keeps you really grounded? Do you have a practice? Do you have a ritual that you engage in? I practice the Wim Hof method, which mm -hmm. is a, uh, a set of breath work uh, in, in exercises. And um, I, I ended up getting away from that a little bit over the summer because I was doing a lot of meditating in the garden in the backyard, uh, laying down concrete blocks, uh, building up the, the, you know, we put, I put up a greenhouse and um, just doing those sort of, um, that sort of yard work in a sense, uh, was very meditative. And I realized that uh, because I didn't have enough time in the day to do my editing and my interviews and research and do Wim Hof and do the garden. So I, I kind of exchanged the Wim Hof work with the gardening work and it worked out because it was a med I got a lot out of that. There was a lot of med meditation going on as I was working with those, uh, those elements, with the stone elements for laying the brickwork and with the wood elements for building the grow boxes and then the soil elements for laying down the, mixing the soil and, and, and getting it ready to then seed the seeds and it is the whole process it's amazing everybody should be gardening like it's a it's a it's a very powerful meditative process when you go through the whole process and then you actually finally get to uh, eat your vegetables that you've grown um so that was summer now i'm back into the wim hof method again uh less and are you referring to rhythmic breathing when you talk about w wim hof yeah it's it's a it's, his, his method is kind of um I haven't studied officially Kundalini, but I've talked to a lot of Kundalini um, uh, practitioners and I've, and I've guided them through some Wim Hof methods sessions. And they say the sensations that are created through this breath work are very similar to Kundalini yoga work. Um, so what we're doing is uh, um, it's, it's, it's big deep breaths in, and nice relaxed out when we do a set of those about 20 or 30 um and then we hold the breath on the exhale and then we take a deep, deep breath in and then we do another round and we keep going and we in the longer we go for longer periods of holding and then bigger deep breaths in and then the sensations and it's it's i have a a youtube video i put out a little mini video called the the alchemy of wim hof um, which I shot just locally here in Big Bear as I was sort of, that was my beginnings of learning that process and, and, uh, and some of the downloads that I got during that process. And I continue to get downloads because um, what we're doing is, I believe with every session of Wim Hof or any type of Qigong or any type of breathing or meditation is we're, we're literally creating portals to other dimensions uh, that we can then go through and access information. And this is why in the meditative state, when we quiet our minds and when we focus on the breath, we are going into that space where um, the uh, talk about gatekeepers of the media and these kinds of things. We are our own gatekeepers to the other sides, the veils. Mm -hmm. And when we take ingest the plant medicine or we create these modalities to have uh, communication to the other side, then the information is, becomes more free flowing. And the more we do that, the more we create the, the, that, those portals, the more information can flow in from these higher dimensions. Mm. So Ruben, this is Dare to Dream. What mm -hmm. do you next Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams or goals? Well, I kind of already said it with doing that interview on the spaceship, <laughs> but... Uh, but let me go big picture. Okay. So as we all know, we are going through a major transformation on the planet right now. It seems hectic and chaotic and crazy, and it is. You know, there's a lot going on with pandemics and political chaos and uh, monetary chaos with, with uh, uh, different things. But what I see happening is the shift in consciousness as far as everyone fully coming to the realization that we are individually sovereign beings with immense power to 
create whatever we want to create. Mm -hmm. To wake up to that. And we can talk about it and, 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 and we can remind people that we're all interconnected and that we're all one and we all create our own reality. These are buzzwords we've heard for decades. But we, to truly understand that, and to truly understand that, we have to go, in a sense, we don't all have to, but we are going through what we're going through to help us awaken to that fact. And once we, the majority of us, awaken, awaken to that fact, that we can create whatever reality we choose, I think, I have faith in humanity. There's a lot of good people on this planet with good intentions. And when we focus those intentions and that goodness, and we can harmonize and become a coherent force, which we're doing right now, we're just, we're figuring it out. This is new energy. This is new technologies, new modalities that we're playing with. As we continue to play and continue to sync up and figure it out, what I see happening in the next 10, 20, 30 years is a place unrecognizable than where we are now. We can't even fathom, we can't even use our imagination. And I'm one who uses my imagination to create a, some big things. Uh, we can't even imagine what that's going to look like because it's never been done before on this planet. And I know it's very epic, something that I'm talking about here. This is like the most epic of all epicness. And it is for the human race. This is the biggest thing to ever happen in our DNA and our lifetimes and all lifetimes and in history and in the universe. And this is why we have so much assistance right now from behind the veil, from our ET brothers and sisters, from grandmother, mama, pacha, pacha, mama. Um, this is why all of this is, all of this assistance is here right now to help us come to this realization because they know that once we are fully empowered, we will become a very powerful force in the cosmic cosmology of the universe to then go and assist and help other civilizations awaken in their own unique ways. <laughs> well, this has been an amazing couple of hours for me to hang out with you, Ruben. Thank you so much. And for people who want to know more, rubenlangdon.com, best place. That's it, rubenlangdon.com. In my show, uh, Interview with Ed, which is also one word, interviewwithed.org. And you can go to Gaia to see it, and but all that information is there. And also the citizenhearing.org is also another project that will be, more people will be seeing very soon. I end today's show with this quote from Gary Thorpe. Try to be a good audience for whatever kind of experience reveals itself to you. Subscribe to Dare to Dream. It's your number one weekly transformation conversation. My guest next week is Dr. Gabriel Cousins. He's an internationally celebrated spiritual master, a rabbi, and also founder of the modern Essene Order of Light. He already teaches in 40 countries. He's got an enormous amount of information to share with us, and I'm ready to deep dive with him. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, do not just dare to dream. Dare to turn all your dreams into your reality. And maybe one day you will also be with us on that spaceship.